So I think it's now on to tonight's program, 50 years of California raptor natural history and conservation efforts by Dr. Peter Bloom. We are very fortunate to have uh, Pete Bloom here with us this evening. For the past 50 years, Pete has been studying various California raptors, including red-tailed hawks, red-shouldered hawks, golden eagles, ospreys, turkey vultures, California condors, and Swainson's hawk. In the 1980s, he led the effort to capture all the original wild California condors. So it, there's parts that will tie in a little bit with last month's talk by uh, Bill Toon. Much of Pete's research involves banding, tagging, and occasionally fitting transmitters on these important predators, each with their own ecosystem needs. He and his colleagues have captured and banded over 54,000 birds, mostly raptors, furthering knowledge of natal dispersal, philopatry, movements, and unusual migration. By analyzing their movements in Southern California and beyond, these studies have contributed valuable information to conservation efforts throughout California. Pete will share insights gained during these decades long studies, including what he hopes to achieve with future research. So without further ado, it is my very great pleasure to present Dr. Peter Blue. Thank you, Judy. I'm starting my, starting my stopwatch right now. So I have zero in on about 45 minutes of, of conversation here. Thank you for the invitation to speak with the, uh, with your, the Audubon group, Moro Audubon. Uh, I'm Bloom, and I've got 50 years to talk about, and I'm, I'm also going to talk about 50 years of raptor conservation in California in general, and what we've learned, our, our failures, our successes, uh, the challenges that lie ahead, and some of the, the, the neat sort of uh, deep ecology uh, discoveries that I and my colleagues have made by studying common species like red-tailed hawks and red-shouldered hawks and barn owls and horned owls and, and good stuff like that. Well, let me start off with something really depressing. What, what, what sort of different factors contribute to the demise of birds of prey? And I, I wrote a list down about 10 minutes before this talk and I came up with, under the heading of contaminants, we have organochlorine pesticides, organophosphates, uh, something called diclofenac, which is a, a, a pharmaceutical drug. Uh, we have heavy metals like mercury and lead. Those are all bad for scavengers and predatory eagles. Uh, we always have the ubiquitous habitat loss and the uh, subunits of habitat degradation and habitat fragmentation. We have electrocution, of course, particularly for the larger raptors. We have direct shooting from those people who don't have enough targets already. Uh, we have various forms of collisions that kill birds of prey, wind turbines, wires, uh, vehicles. Vehicles are uh, multiple. We have cars that run into, run into birds of prey, planes, helicopters. Uh, we have endangered species management that goes out of its way to kill birds of prey that kill other endangered species, like uh, animal services and, and some of the people uh, that work with them trapping birds of prey, or when they can't trap them, they kill them, and uh, contribute to the demise of local raptor populations, specifically while protecting animals we all love, like uh, snowy plovers and California leaf ferns, but nonetheless, uh, predator, predator, uh, raptors or predatory birds, and some of them take threatened and endangered species. There are also subtle little differences or, or problems like competition between barred owls and spotted owls. And then you have that background noise called climate change. What does climate change change do? Well, today it's creating drought. And with drought comes fire, and fire means habitat change, Habitat change means a change in the diversity of prey that these birds of prey in whatever habitat they live in are lost. So uh, let's, let's go with the first slide. I'm gonna start off with California condors. Uh, real quick, I know you've been here before, probably, probably 30 times in the last 30 years, uh, various condor biologists coming in and giving great talks. So real quick, 
Uh, you know the you know the past Pleistocene was a, a big place for for California condors. Lots of megafauna, uh, including various uh, elephants, as in mammoths, um, shrunk back down toward uh, uh, when Lewis and Clark arrived to the entire Pacific coast, all the way down in the Baja. Then we had the wild population back in 82. And now we have um, several populations, amazingly several populations of California condors, not just in California anymore, but Mexico, Nevada, uh, Utah, Arizona, and uh, coming soon, Oregon, or for all I know, it might be in Oregon. The amazing uh, fact to me is that we're somewhere near 500 now. Uh, we might have passed that, and I know we had a huge uh, loss to, due to fire, and I don't know where our exact number is, but it's reality that we have roughly 500 California condors in the world today. Hasn't been that for more than a century, I'm sure. Next, please. So just some, some important milestones. Um, we started in 1975 with a recovery plan. We didn't see any action until 1982 when we caught the first California condor. 1984 was miraculous. Uh, our, our one and only Cal radioed California condor not only taught us about how the species uses habitat and space, but it taught us how they die. That was one of the most single most important components of the radio telemetry program is what kills them. No, we were we were just children back then when it came to uh, our knowledge of of California condors and the issues that were facing them. 1987, all condors in captivity. 1988, right away, first chick hatched in captivity. Can't beat that. Uh, condor releases in Southern California, Baja, 1992. Hey, lead ammo banned in the California condor range with Tejon Ranch leading the way. Bans lead bullets and shot and preserves, hey, 90% of 270,000 acres. That's 240,000. Coupled with the Wind Wolves Reserve next door with 90,000 acres, one of the reasons that we thought was a major issue for California condors and indeed is a major issue still is habitat loss. Uh, there's a reason they're not in the LA basin anymore. There's a reason they don't nest in Laguna Canyon in Orange County anymore. That's habitat loss. However, uh, I don't think they're suffering from so much from habitat loss anymore. We're, we're, we have a, a fairly stable situation, relatively speaking, when it comes to habitat loss in condors. Not so for a lot of other predatory birds. Lead ammo was born was banned throughout California in 2019. Couldn't get any better. I don't know where Arnold Schwarzenegger was all the years prior, but that guy changed the world for California condors and eagles and anything that eats meat in California, because now lead, at least the frequency of lead poisoning has been, should have been significantly reduced. Not gone by any stretch. We got to remember that there are thousands of rounds of lead ammunition in the back of people's closets that uh, might not be used for target practice, which is completely legal, but it's not supposed to be used when hunting. Next, please. Real quick, I, I mentioned we were children. Well, we didn't even know, we, we didn't know how to catch these birds. Uh, fortunately, Mike Wallace uh, had done some significant trapping of black vultures in Florida, uh, as well as Andean condors in Peru. Uh, Noel Snyder and John Ogden went down there and learned the techniques. They went to South Africa and brought back the cannon net um, um, with its cannons designed by Peter Mundy, um, also from uh, of South Africa. And then uh, later when things started to get a little slow capturing condors, uh, we went to the Native Americans. I read a monograph on the Hidatsa Indians who explained to me how to capture eagles with carcasses. And uh, I, as well as Dave Clendenin, Clendenin uh, captured five of these birds using this pit trap technique. That's uh, me a long, long time ago uh, with a condor on Tejon Ranch and Dave Clendenin took that photo. Next, please. 
So here are the here are the reasons for the decline. I'm not going to go into great detail here, but it's important because other birds suffer from the same issues. Golden eagles, all of these same issues affect golden eagles and bald eagles except microtrash. Microtrash is unique to California condors, uh, at least as far as I'm aware, in North America. But a lot of other birds, but particularly eagles, are hammered by lead poisoning. Uh, DDE, DDT for the bald eagle, not so much for the golden eagle, power line collisions by both eagles, habitat loss by basically all birds of prey. And wind farms clip a lot of golden eagles in particular, but not so much bald eagles. It's interesting the nuances of the, of the anthropogenic causes of death that affect one species, but not another, and why that's so. Next, please. Here's some, uh, here are the, the numbers up until 2017, between 1992 and 2017, for 290 condors. Remember back in 1982, we didn't have an, any idea what was killing California condors. Having said that, I'll take a moment to, uh, to uh, uh, acknowledge Noel Snyder, Dr. Snyder, who once upon a time when I arrived about May or June of 1982, we were having lunch and he asked the half a dozen of us at the table and said, what do you guys think are killing California condors? I hadn't a clue. And um, everybody offered up their thoughts and, and Noel said, I think it's lead. lead Noel had an inclination <laughs> uh, right from the get-go that lead was gonna be the issue and he was right on the mark. Next. So lead is responsible for 52% of all diagnosed mortalities. I'm sure you've seen this slide, dead, dead mule deer on the left, um, California condors with lead poisoning in the gut that this particular animal consumed and died thereof. Next, please. Wind farms are a big issue. They haven't killed any California condors yet, but there's no reason to think that they won't. The Tehachapi's uh, were once um, a location where California, California condors uh, rarely went, at least in the southern end of it, on the, on the edge of the uh, Antelope Valley. Today, uh, they very much utilize that area and so far have managed to avoid being clipped by uh, any of the wind, the, the thousands of wind turbines there. Uh, a lot of golden eagles have been killed but nowhere near the numbers that have been um, uh, killed in the Altamont Pass. This is a relatively low density of eagles here as opposed to the Altamont. We wish the California condors the best around here because uh, as the California condor population increases, the number of wind turbines increase and they encroach closer and closer on condor range, there's likely gonna be a mortality. The good news is there are fairly extensive mitigation measures already in place negotiated between the wind farm companies and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and California Department of Fish and Wildlife and other agencies. Next, please. More wind farms. They, uh, they take up a lot of space. And uh, when it comes to eagles, burrowing owls, and red-tailed hawks, they are fatal. Um, they really can knock out large numbers of birds annually. Speaking for the Altamont Pass in particular. Next. And finally, uh, a quick overview of the release sites for California condors. I think you've probably seen this already. Uh, we're really cooking when it comes to condor releases. Uh, multiple um, locations where the birds reside is a very good um, uh, a good situation where the loss of any one mortality won't lead to the loss of the next one. And that's again, uh, without even mentioning the fact that they're supposed to be coming to Oregon soon if they aren't there already. Next, please. Next. And finally, future for California economy. Let's talk, we'll talk just a little bit about this. Funding is going to be an issue. 
The California condor is not the only endangered species in California, much less North America. There'll be many more species, many more endangered species coming in the future. They're not all gonna be animals with nine foot wingspans and weigh 23 pounds and glorify the skies and uh, uh, are otherwise loved by people. They're gonna be little things like coastal horn lizards, orange throated whiptails, uh, California gnat catchers, least bells vireos, and things like that that need that money. So there's gonna be some competition coming fast for the condor. The condor is a conservation reliant species as identified by J. Michael Scott in a wonderful publication a couple of decades ago. And it's gonna, it's gonna take us to continue feeding it. There isn't enough food out there. And not only that, but that food ensures that they don't eat as much lead. Micro trash will probably always be there. Organochlorines are an issue. Some people think they aren't, but they really are, particularly for the coastal population. You're never gonna get away from organochlorines for a long time um, in, around the ocean because those animals, those sea mammals are, are going to be, well, they're laden with organochlorines because of the fat, their heavy fat content. And there's West Nile virus and other emerging diseases. So we're, we're gonna have issues with them. It's important to consider the future and other endangered species. Next, please. So here's several of them right here. Um, uh, the burrowing owl, red-tailed hawk, barn owl, Cooper's hawk. Those are all species that uh, I have worked on extensively for more than 50 years. My main focus though on all of the species that I work on is a subject called natal dispersal. And that's important because it has uh, tremendous uh, um, conservation implications that include gene flow, uh, colonization, and evolution. And what, what's some interesting background there in terms of the science is, why do animals disperse? Why do any animals disperse, not just raptors? Well, it's thought inbreeding avoidance is part of that, uh, avoidance of kin uh, competition, and uh, population extinctions. Dispersal can prevent population extinctions. The lack of it can promote it. And unlike migration, which is strongly directional, uh, as in red-tailed hawks moving from uh, on migration, Southern California, dispersal is generally random. So they're in directions all over the place. And you'll see that in a little bit in a few slides. The cost of dispersal is uh, that if you do, if you travel great distances, the stronger tendency to lose your life early, uh, resulting uh, from predation um, or accidents. Finding a territory is the cost of dispersal and finding a mate. Next, please. So how do you do, how do you look at, uh, uh, how do you study natal dispersal? I can see I got to pick up my pace here. And uh, so you, from, it's a study of nestlings, really. So you want to mark as many nestlings as possible. You want to have a large study area because if you have a small study area, it's going to, the resulting data are going to be biased because you're going to recapture or find dead the birds that you banded and other people, uh, not as much so. You band over a long span of time the same region along with outside regions so that there's an unbiased group, unbiased groups outside. And you expend tens of thousands of hours and dollars attempting to recapture those banded birds that you marked. Then you analyze all that data and you try to make sense of it. And the bird banding laboratory is priceless here because they take in all the information that you people from the public add to the database. I recapture a lot of birds, but the bird banding laboratory provides me with a whole lot of encounter data, such as these ospreys that uh, the local Audubon chapter here, Morrow Audubon has been uh, discovering, have moved from Orange County to Morrow Bay. Next, please. A definition of phyllopatry. First, let me tell you that 
natal dispersal has a, a couple of different components and there are long distance dispersers, there are vagrants, and there are short distance dispersers. And the short distance dispersers have a special term. They're called phallopatric, particularly when those distances are quite short. And there's a, and there's a chance for some level of inbreeding. And in, I, in my case, in my research, I chose um, uh, a diameter of less than five territory home ranges to be an animal who is strongly phallopatric. Next, please. So here's my study area down in Southern California. This is the main study area. I consider California my study area, but I've even branded birds in San Luis Obispo County, uh, red tails and such. But the, the main study area is Orange County and surrounding environs. And uh, what we discovered was something extremely unusual. And that is that of all the, of the birds, of the red-tailed hawks that we banded, they all traveled, literally all traveled north directly after fledging. Some of them went as far north as uh, Montana and crossed the continental divide. And we had some birds that were banded and we had 17 with transmitters. All 17 birds traveled north. Some of the birds that were banded traveled south, but we were pretty confident that those birds who traveled south first traveled north and then were recovered in uh, occasionally in uh, Mexico, but quite remarkable because these are birds that migrate in the summer and the birds from San Luis Obispo probably also do the same. Uh, there's a, uh, a, uh, a, a latitude that is escaping me, but I think I got it on the next slide. Basically birds born below, red-tailed hawks born below Reno, Nevada migrate north and those above it migrate south. And then in the case of the birds who migrate north, they do two or three different, two or three migrations back and forth um, over about a three year period. But they return to that natal area, like in the bottom of that little, little uh, burst of, of dispersal, all in fairly random directions. Uh, that's where the birds are returning, essentially to where we banded them as nestlings. Next, please. So we put some radio transmitters on nestlings, and here is an adult, here, here's a female that we banded as a nestling in Laguna Canyon, Orange County, California. And the, the um, graphic on the left is the northbound migration, all four of them, because we had, uh, we monitored the, the bird in 2004 through 2007. So we had four migrations um, to the north and four migrations to the south. And it wound up um, roughly, I'm gonna say 15 miles from where it fledged as a youngster uh, and unfortunately was electrocuted. So. Um, it happens to the best of them. Next, please. And again, that migration is in summer and most of the birds are back on their nest, in their nesting area where they fledged in September to November of the same year. In fact, all of them are. So here's an idea of of some of the dispersal distances from recaptures. And uh, let's see, what do we have here? So we had a range for females of two to 103 kilometers and the males one to 24 uh, combined one to 103. Median dispersal distance basically of five kilometers for, well, yeah, five kilometers for all of, for both sexes, five kilometers. That was the most frequent natal dispersal distance for that number of birds. 96 birds traveled a median distance of five kilometers. That says a lot. In other words, the populations that you see in your neighborhood, those are your populations. Those aren't coming from Utah and breeding there. They're not coming from Nevada. 
They're not coming even from Northern California. They're coming from your immediate neighborhood. And hence, if you have problems in your neighborhood, uh, like with Swainson's hawks, which has happened to them, and you lose whole populations, nobody comes back to those populations when they're gone because it takes so long for them to be replaced because the natal dispersers don't disperse far enough. They're dispersing short distances. So recolonization is a long process that takes decades. Hence the reason least bells vireo is taking so long to reestablish itself across California. Next, please. I'm not gonna dwell on this one too much. Notice we had 48 encounters here on the bottom. I talked about recaptures just a moment ago. We had 48 encounters. This was like 2011. We have a lot more of these now. And 37 of them, 77% were fellow Patrick. They were uh, either recovered within five kilometers or within the adjacent 10 minute block. And look at this slide on the right. That is the distribution on one quad, a, uh, I think this is a 10 minute, 15 minute quad. Uh, this, these are all the red tailed hawk nests that were in this area of Orange County near San Clemente in Camp Pendleton. And you'll notice there's a pretty standard distance between them. And then you see all these lines. Well, those lines are the distances between a natal site and where we recaptured it breeding. And um, when, I, when I started graduate school for my PhD, I was like, I was 50. When I finished, I was 60. And I analyzed 30, four, 30 years of natal dispersal data. Well, now we have 40. And this is the one publication from my dissertation that hasn't come to fruition yet, but I hope that uh, this summer will, it'll come to light. You'll, you'll enjoy it. Next, please. We did similar things with red-shouldered hawks. I'm not gonna go into as much detail here. Hang on one sec. But we banded a lot, we banded about 7,000 red-tailed hawk nestlings for that earlier study that I just talked about. We banded nearly 3,000 red-shouldered hawks for this study. But it was, it, the results are different. They're, they're related, but different. Let's go on to the next slide. So um, what we had were 10 animals out of 119 who turned out to be what we termed, what we defined as long distance dispersers. And of those long distance dispersers, there were three vagrants. What's a vagrant? A vagrant is an animal that is found outside of its normal breeding range, wintering range, or migration corridors. So these are birds that are effectively lost. Being lost has important advantages. If you happen to have been a Swainson's hawk, let's say several hundred thousand or a million years ago, and you stumbled onto the Galapagos Islands and you found a mate by some amazing circumstance, you, your, you and your progeny would have helped create the Galapagos hawk because that's the nearest relative of the Galapagos hawk. And so that, those were examples of vagrants, but they were successful vagrants. Now we, we looked at our birds and let me see if I can, next slide please, see what we find. So if you look at the bullet number three, eight of 10 long distance dispersers, 80% that travel greater than 100 kilometers are found dead or near death at less than 22 months. In other words, they weren't breeders yet. The oldest bird made it to 8.6 years. There was one winner there. Now, if you drop to the fourth one, 45% of the hawks that travel less than 100 kilometers were recovered at less than 22 months. The oldest bird was 19.9 years, 20 years. And if you look over at the results so to the left, you'll note our three vagrants. They're number nine, number three, and number four. One went all the way down, left the species range basically, and traveled all the way down to Guerrero Negro, um, died there as a young bird, 
Uh, bird number three went to Las Vegas, Nevada. You know, red shoulders are riparian birds. They're not supposed to cross the Mojave Desert, but these two did. Number three and number nine. Number nine died on the border between Nevada and Utah of West Nile virus. Next, please. So there's the, a female red shouldered hawk telling you the moral of the story that uh, it's a lot safer to stay at home, find a mate and breed than to go off and be adventurous, explore new lands and die. Next, please. So we haven't banded as many Cooper's hawks. I'm not really banding very many anymore anyway, but look what we found with just 1300, we'll say 1400 nestlings banded. We got three encounters that where all three went north, suggesting that Cooper's hawks also migrate north, probably also in the summer, but perhaps focusing on the fall migration when the birds are heading south and the Cooper's hawks are setting, heading north into those uh, prey. Um, Red-tailed hawks are thought to disperse north because of the ground squirrels that are emerging all across the Great Basin. There's 34 species of squirrels and chipmunks and marmots across the distribution of these red-tailed hawk recoveries. So we think that squirrels are the driving force between for why they leave Southern California. Why leave Southern California? Because it gets too hot. This, the California ground squirrel is known to estivate for several months. And so during summer, there's nothing to eat here anymore. The, ground, the, the snakes that they uh, prefer are now underground or they're nocturnal. So they, they vacate Southern California, go north for a couple, two or three months during the hot period and come right home. Cooper's hawks uh, provide us just a, a few hints there that they might be doing the same, uh, needs a lot more study. We banded 1400 and got three interesting ones. Note that none of them went south. And we do have other recoveries, but they're local to Orange County and San Diego County. Next, please. Here's a tragic story. This is literally the last pair of burrowing owls in Orange County. That was a female who died in 2015. She was uh, 17 or she was seven years old at the time she disappeared. And um, I grew up in Orange County. This was an extremely abundant species. Um, speaking of habitat loss, this is the, uh, the premier animal that uh, displays what happens when, you, when all your habitat is removed. And uh, humans have certainly accomplished that in Orange County. Variety of other issues um, that include that long list of mortality um, factors that, that I gave in the beginning, including collisions with cars, house cats, domestic cats, in other words, um, <clears throat> including even um, predator management at turn colonies. All of the coastal burrowing owls from Santa Barbara south to the Mexican border are now gone from the coast, from the immediate coast. And a lot of that is directly attributable to removing or directly killing burrowing owls at least turn colonies or beaches that also hold, house uh, snowy plovers. We've created a conflict between animals. It's not their fault, but we're intervening and a lot of times they get killed in the process. Next, please. I'm public, I've got a manuscript, uh, nearly impressed on that subject, by the way, for Orange County. So here is the burrowing owl distribution in California. Um, this one by uh, uh, 2008, produced by Western Field Ornithologist in the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. This, look at, look at uh, California. See all that area in Northeastern California? That is very suggestive of a lot of burrowing owls. But I spent five years working for the Bureau of Land Management up there and I don't think I ever saw five pairs in a single year in that vicinity. So they're a very rare animal up there. And even in the Mojave Desert, 
they are not abundant. They might be abundant in the Antelope Valley, which is part of the Mojave Desert, but if you go east, they're, they're rare and few and far between. We are losing them. In fact, we have lost them on the, on the immediate coast of uh, southwestern California. Next. Causes of burrowing owl extirpation. I'll let you just, I'll, I'll go through a few of them. Um, hey, photographers, I've got, I, uh, there, was some, there were some wintering burrowing owls uh, near uh, Fountain Valley. And a, I saw this on the internet where a photographer had this incredible photograph of a Cooper's hawk killing a burrowing owl at this park. Well, that bird died because the photographer chased the burrowing owl and the Cooper's hawk saw it. The, bur the burrowing owl would never have left its burrow if the, if the photographer hadn't pursued it. And bird watchers can do the same. So I guess what I'm saying is be careful, guys. Um, we don't want to interfere with wildlife. We don't want to love them to death. And all these other issues are there too. Next, please. Golden Eagles. Speaking for, um, I could speak well for the Santa Ana Mountains and they're on their way out. Um, I really see them as a, an animal that due to lead poisoning, electrocution, and a variety of other reasons, um, including the fact of the, the, the fact that there are no recruits coming back. The young that leave the nest are not returning into the Santa Ana Mountains. And basically we, use two, we lose two or three territories per decade. Next, please. Nice list of mortality factors that we're aware of. Fires are huge. We have lots of them in Orange County and San Diego County. That, that was all former Golden Eagle habitat. The jackrabbit is gone in Orange County. There were tens of thousands of jackrabbits. There's not one jackrabbit left except for Naval Weapon Station Seal Beach. There's the, probably about 30 of them left there. Next. California ground squirrel, another important species. The problem for the eagle in Orange, San Diego, Western Riverside counties is that the housing developments have squeezed all of the best foraging habitat out and the eagles are left with the chaparral only. That is not conducive to ground squirrels. It's not conducive to jackrabbits. And even if they were there, the eagles have difficulty or probably have difficulty foraging in the chaparral. Next. We're learning a lot about eagle uh, movements. We radio transmitted about 50 of these, USGS and I. Oh, we've got some fantastic results. Some of those, lots of those, pub some of those publications have already come out. Uh, let me show you two of the birds that have done some moving. Next. These are, these are both adult eagles. Lots to learn about eagles. When you think you're looking at an adult eagle and it's a member of a breeding territory that you're looking at, you need to know that you're not necessarily looking at a member of the breeding territory. It could be somebody who's just moving through. And it might be that we learned that some of these residents do disperse quite long distances and then return back to their breeding territory. So here's a bird who went to Wyoming and another one that went to Baja del Sur. Lots to learn about them. Next, please. And uh, inquisitive golden eagle from the Tehachapi range. Next. Swainson's hawks are on the rebound. That's one of the news species. Um, very happy to report that. However, local areas such as the Antelope Valley, the population went from one pair in 1979 to 15 pairs, 14 or 15 pairs in 2021. Uh, but the solar industry um, impacts resulting from habitat loss due to the placement of solar panels is overwhelming the breeding pairs there and we may lose them in the Antelope Valley despite the comeback. Next please. Next please. Turkey vultures. We're on to turkey vultures. 
I'm, I'm done with California condors pretty much, although I'm rooting them every day, rooting for them every day. But we're now studying uh, turkey vultures, which are a good surrogate. Uh, they also consume lead and we wanna know how they deal with it. We also wanna know more about their movements. Uh, some of our Orange County turkey vultures have been seen in Santa Barbara, um, but no further north, although we've had migrants from the desert go up into uh, the Columbia River Basin. Next, please. Taking blood, feather samples. Next. Next, please. Turkey vulture nests are really hard to find. <laughs> um, this would be a, an excellent master's uh, thesis for somebody in San Luis Obispo County because there's a lot of turkey vultures there and they're clearly nesting in those rocks and all those boulders around San Luis Obispo. But these are, these are two Orange County territories and uh, the chicks are about, about four weeks old. And we attach potassium tags to them. We haven't put any transmitters on them yet. We can't, can't afford that yet, but we, we, are, we are marking them, we're blood sampling them, and we're looking at their uh, productivity over the course of the nesting season. Next, please. Next. Keep your eye open for those wing tags. Here's a, an early analysis of 80 sightings between 2016 and 2017. The birds were basically marked in the center, and that's what we've seen. That was that is what we have seen to date. But now, as I kind of mentioned, go all the way down to the Mexican border, and all the way up to Santa Barbara. Next, please. So, conservation successes. What's the difference here? Let me. Where am I on the great my clock here? Hang on. I know I'm running out of time. Forty. Forty minutes. So I got five minutes left, right, Cooty? Wendy. <laughs> um, okay, real quick. Take the time you need, Pete. <laughs> okay, all three of these birds, what's unique about these three that didn't impact the others as much is that they suffer from organochlorines. We identified that people like Dr. Robert Risebro, Dr. David Peekel, and others around the world identified the issue. The United States, Canada, and others all banned. DDT and other organochlorines, and the birds made their way back um, without much else needed. What happened with the bald eagle is not only in the interim while they were gone, we created all these reservoirs. So there was even more habitat than when they were nearly extirpated or ex before the nearly caused, nearly brought to extinction. Likewise, the peregrine, there's tens of thousands more potential nest sites for peregrines than, than when they uh, took a nosedive. Um, I think it's one of, the, one of the biggest problems today for California least terns and snowy plovers is there's probably twice as many breeding peregrines in California than there were historically because of all the buildings, bridges, water towers, and other stuff. And the osprey, the osprey just needed to be able to breed and to not suffer from mercury or organochlorine pesticides. Those guys have made a miraculous recovery. I think the California condor is, is in the same neighborhood, but it'll always be conservation reliant. These three species are not conservation reliant. We don't have to do anything more for them. They're done. They're off the endangered species list, or they should be. The bald eagle is still a California endangered species. Next, please. Conservation challenges. Spotted owl. I mentioned the uh, the issue with um, competition with the barred owl. It's a big deal. Uh, what are we going to do? Well, we're killing barred owls <laughs> to to protect the spotted owl. This animal will likely also be conservation reliant forever. We will always be in the in the job of controlling barred owls. And I think if we didn't do that, that the barred owl would come all the way into Southern California and we would lose both Northern and Southern spotted owls. Northern Harrier habitat issue, coupled with the fact that it nests on the ground, it's a, it's a tough place to nest and be productive. Uh, 
short-eared owl. I consider the short-eared owl to be the most endangered bird of prey in California. Uh, it might have been so even back in 1980, when 1984, when we were listed the Swainson's hawk. Short-eared owl should have been listed at the same time, but it's, it's a habitat issue with the short-eared owl. We don't know, we have never figured out what caused the uh, catastrophic decline of Swainson's hawks uh, prior to 1979. Uh, golden eagles, we just, we just talked about, but how about these common raptors? Red-tailed hawk, white-tailed kite, red-shouldered hawk. White-tailed kites in Orange County, I have about 200 territories, historic territories in Orange and San Diego County. 90, greater than 95% of them are vacant. They're no longer occupied. Orange County, we see about three to five territories per year now, as opposed to at least 100 territories annually. They're gone. They're all but extinct. <laughs> uh, speaking for the red-shouldered hawk, why would I have the red-shouldered hawk in there? Well, it's because I studied it for 50 years. And likewise, their num the numbers of occupied territories has dropped by something in the neighborhood of, hang on, let me remember this correctly. Uh, their numbers have dropped by 30%. And the red-tailed hawk numbers have dropped by 50%. And there's no explanation that I can come up with other than potentially rodenticides, climate change, West Nile virus, and with climate change, the changes in habitat in the, in the fauna that the birds feed on caused by fire. Next slide. These are conservation challenges. And real quick, um, I have a lot of friends <laughs> and agencies who have helped me out over the past, and this includes most, most all of them. Some of them are co-workers and collaborators. Some of them are agencies who have provided funds. And some of them are just friends. Um, and that ends our program. And I'm very interested in any questions anyone might have.